Good morning. That's better, that's better. Lovely to see everybody this morning. Uh, this time last week, Joe and I were laying on beds around the pool in Santorini. So obviously I'm really pleased to be back. <laughs> no, it's lovely, lovely seeing you all. And uh, it was great because we actually had YouTube going and we were on our own beds with your phones in and we watched the service with you all. So it was great. So thank you for all you tech guys. It makes such a difference. And uh, listening to Jim speaking God's word last week was, was something special. It was lovely. Um, so welcome this morning. As we say every week, if it's your first time or your thousand or first time, it is lovely to see you. And thank you for joining us. Um, tell your friends, bring them all along. We've got some great news for everybody. And it'd be lovely to see everybody. Right, I'll just open in prayer, um, hand over to the guys, and then come back and run through a couple of notices um, in a couple of minutes then. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come to you again this morning, and we just say thank you for the opportunity of just gathering together, something we take for granted. And we just look around the world now, Sudan and Ukraine and places where this just isn't possible. And Father, we just thank you that we are here together. We are a family together. We are children. You brought us together. And Father, we just thank you for the opportunity of sharing. And as we gather this morning now, Lord, we just pray that all that goes on will glorify you. From the speaking, the singing, the banter, the chatting afterwards, that you will be glorified in it all. And that you and your spirit will be present here. That you move in this place. And as Ed speaks later, Lord, that you would just touch his words and that you will accomplish those which you, you wanted to do, Lord. That you'll go out and touch the heart of us all. That nobody will, will leave this place, Lord, untouched with what's been said and what you've had to say. So, Father, be with us now this morning, we pray. Holy Spirit, come and meet with us, move amongst us. And, Lord Jesus, be present, we pray. In your lovely name, amen. Amen. Right, the guys behind Jessica, guys, and start off with a new song this morning, um, God is for us. So, the first verse and chorus, we start a bit slowly, get into it, and then we'll, um, we'll ramp it up a bit and take it through at normal speed. We won't fear the battle, we won't fear the night. We will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us, you will lead the way. We have found a refuge, only you can save. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. Raise your voice now, the love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? We won't be the battle, we won't be the night, we will walk the
strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, roll out this grave. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Sing with joy now, our God is for us. Thank you very much. Nice new song. Enjoy that one, Jeff. Good. Right, okay. Uh, are we on? Yep, lovely. Um, right, I can say welcome this morning. This is a little bit earlier. Um, this morning we have Ed speaking to us on uh, Living Stones, carrying on a series with Peter. Uh, we also have a family communion, which is going to follow straight on after notices that lead us into that. But I'll say a little bit more about that now when we get to it. So we'll have a family communion. Um, starting off now before the, the main meeting starts itself. Uh, we have youth church and creche and junior church all running up behind us. So during the songs, as you see the, the leaders stand by the door, the green t-shirts on, have a look. And if you have children, by all means, send them out. If you're new, you want to have a look where they go in, by all means, go and see. Um, and then the kids will be brought back to you then at the end of service. Welcome, Lydia. Hope I said that right. Yeah, 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 welcome. Uh, Lydia is from Ukraine. Uh, her church is in Kiev, and she's joined Kerry and I and is with them now at the moment. So just want to say a big welcome. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just a big welcome to Denvent. <laughs> I hope you enjoy being with us. It's lovely to have you. I hope you feel part of our family. It's really nice to see you. Um, only a couple of notes this morning. Um, there are a couple of release events going on. The one on the right-hand side, I'm looking at it, yeah, and you guys. Um, Prayer for Sudan, that's tomorrow, that's the first one. That's been held down in Waterfront Church at 7 p.m. Um, and again, it's, it's prayer for our brothers and sisters out there in Sudan. And the next event then is If Prison Wars Could Speak. It's a dramatization, and I wrote his name down, Peter Jasek, uh, his time in prison. Um, we've been detained out there in Sudan. Now, that is on the 6th of June. Um, the tickets are available. I think they're £8 each. They're all, it's all in the note sheet. If you grab one on the way out, or it's online on the WhatsApp group uh, or on email. Um, but if you need more information regarding the release and the events, have a chat with Paul Thomas, and, and Paul will bring you up to speed what's going on with that. Right. Um, now, Phil has been involved in this for many, many years in Denver, then obviously alongside Phil. Um, show Jesus. Um, uh, go around the Royal Welsh shows, different shows. We also borrow the tents uh, for our summer camps. And some of the roof sections, on, on, especially on the main big tent, need replacing. So uh, each section, apparently £400 a piece. Uh, we need a few of them. So for the next three weeks, Denver is put in their um, standard offering or do a special offering, sorry, for the Show Jesus tent. So if anybody feels you want to give towards it and you put uh, an offering in the box, just mark it, Show Jesus, we know it's for that. Or if you do, end up, if you do give online and you support the church online and you want your offering to go towards that, then just mark it on your payment in the bank that it's Show Jesus and make sure that money goes direct to that. It's just to replace the, the roof sections. And then next Sunday... Uh, again, I think Ed is speaking to us. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ed again next Sunday. Um, living godly lives in a pagan world, carrying on um, the book of Peter. And um, it always amazes me when you, we read these books. They're not just books. This is a guy who actually walked with Jesus. He spoke with Jesus. He's a guy who three times said, I don't know him. He's a guy who Jesus said, on you, I'll build my, my you and my rock, I'll build my church. Um, so it's not just a book, not just a letter in the Bible. This, these are words of a man who actually walked the walk with Jesus. And yeah, it's, it's been a really, really good season. And thank you to all the guys who are bringing the words to us. Ed, Phil, Dave, um, last week, 
Jim, and Jim, then Jim, Jack, then Jim, Jim, everybody who's speaking and doing their bit on it. Um, it's wonderful, Dave. Thank you, everybody. So, um, yeah, really enjoying that. So next week, we have Ed. And also then, 9.30 to 10, back on Zoom, uh, we have communion. If anybody needs the Zoom links, again, they're in the notice sheet. They're online on WhatsApp. Um, just grab a sheet on the way out. I know the links are in there. So you know exactly how to get on there. Oops. And then family communion. Um, decided this week the communion is going to be carried out now to give everybody a chance to be um, in it together. For parents and children, um, as a church, we don't mind the children taking communion along with us, having the bread and the juice, as long as you as parents are happy for them to have it. So as the bread and the juice come around together, um, please feel free. If you have your child with you, you want them to take it, that's not a problem. So we look at taking the bread and the juice together. Uh, we won't be pausing in between. We'll have the bread given out, uh, and then we'll have the juice. But just before we do that, obviously it's all been a quick move in this morning, I just want to quiet us down a little bit and just get us to reflect on, on why we're taking it, why we're taking the bread and the juice. Um, other places use wine. We decided to use juice here. It's only normal bread. It's only normal juice. There's nothing special about what we are using it's not sanctified juice and special bread that's been blessed. It's just basic stuff. Just that they had basic stuff back in Jesus' day. I can read a couple of words which probably get read, read every Sunday in most communions. And we tend to skirt over them. I know I do. But let's just have a little think of what, what is being said. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed... And then think of that. On the night he was betrayed, this wasn't the week before, in a matter of hours from this point, it was all going to kick off, it was all going to start. The suffering, the beatings, he knew everything that was going to happen. He didn't run the other direction. He, he didn't ask, guys, protect me, I need you. you what I, on, this, on the night he was betrayed, in a matter of hours, he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He's just asking us to remember him. It's not much there. It's not much. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, Remember me. He's just off to have his body smashed, ripped apart. He's off to hang on a cross to take our punishment for our sins. He's there to do it all. And all he's asking us to do is, please, guys, remember me. Whenever you take the bread and, and the wine and the juice, just, just remember me. This morning now, we just want to calm ourselves down. I'll lead us in a prayer and then maybe have a couple of minutes where we just reflect ourselves to bring us to that point of just saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. That's all, that's all we've been asked to do. He's done it all. And then maybe after a minute or so, Dave, you could arrange for the bread and the juice to go around. And as we take, have the bread and we have the juice, please just take it automatically, take it straight away. Don't worry about waiting to take it together with the children. So we take it together, but I'll pray now and then we'll just have a, a minute or two where we just reflect ourselves think of what's been done, what he's done for us and then we'll take the bread and juice together Heavenly Father Lord Jesus, words, thank you just don't seem enough how, how can I say thank you be all that you want us to do, to remember you your plan was always Lord that you would come, you would give yourself you, you would be the sacrifice, the Lamb of God you would be the one who would die on the cross just so that we could have eternal life with you you offer salvation to pay the penalty for our sins and all we've got to say is thank you accept you as our saviour Lord thank you we remember you again this morning we remember your body broken for us we remember your blood poured out for us we remember Lord your ultimate sacrifice Lord we promise we do this in remembrance of you and Lord, we don't just remember the crucifixion because we remember the victory. 
And Lord, remember the, the riser from the grave after three days. Sin, hell, death defeated. You have the victory, we have the victory, and it's all through you. And this morning, Lord, while we remember your body broken and bruised and crushed and, and your blood poured out, Lord, we also remember the victory, the victory of you rising from the dead. And Lord, we say thank you for your sacrifice and we say, Lord, thank you for your victory. And Father, as we take this this morning, and we just want to say thank you. Move amongst us, we pray. Touch our hearts. Convict us for what we need to be convicted with, Lord. Help us put ourselves right with you in these couple of minutes now before we join together and enjoy this meal of bread and juice in remembrance of you as you want us to do. In your loving name we pray. Amen. That the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, he's free.
we stand and sing together?
we just thank you so much for Ed's message that he's prepared and we just pray that you would um, just fill his heart, Lord, with what you want him to say and just ready our hearts, Lord, that we may be um, really receptive, Lord, to your Holy Spirit um, and to your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, Kev opened his, um, uh, uh, our time together by saying, we have great news and it's for everybody, which is true, isn't it? We have great news, uh, praise God, and that great news is for everybody, um, which is absolutely wonderful. That great news that, that we know as Christians is for everybody. And I think it's really rude if we keep it to ourselves. <laughs> Um, so it's our job to tell people that great news that we have because it is for everybody, it's for all people because Jesus is for all people and Jesus wants all people to be saved and it's our job now as Christians um, to go and tell all people this good news that we know about Jesus that's our role as Christians and that's basically what uh, I'm going to be speaking about this morning um, so that's the short version um, now we can have the longer version <laughs> But in a nutshell, that's it. Um, uh, we, we, we have a duty to the rest of the world, to the whole globe. Every single person living on this planet right now and those who are going to be living on it in our lifetime, it's, it's our responsibility as followers of Jesus to go and tell people who aren't yet followers of Jesus that good news about him. It's a wonderful truth that we have inside us and it's our role, our job, to go and tell people. Um, can we just pop back um, a couple of slides to, I think it's the, um, uh, the bridge, or maybe it's the chorus of that song. Um, yeah, and just back what, one more, I think. Thank you, yeah. Um, I just wrote down uh, on my uh, notes here, um, truth, when we were singing that, um, uh, that uh, chorus there, holy, there is no one like you, there is none besides you. And Lord, open up my eyes in wonder. Lord, open up all of our eyes to who you are. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. That's the message of 1 Peter there, um, or at least... Um, uh, the passage that we're going to be having a look at. But isn't that true? Can we just have the next one, please, James, also? Because I... Oh, sorry. Um, the, thank you. Because um, I put a question mark by this. It says, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. That's true. I will put my trust in you alone. Which I hope is also true. It's not always easy. But that last bit, I will not be shaken. Boy, I, I get shaken. Stuff happens, doesn't it, in life? And... We get shaken. Thing, things come at us and we're not expecting it and we get shaken. But Jesus doesn't. And Jesus is that rock that is that firm foundation. He will not be shaken. He will never be shaken. And yes, spiritually, theologically, we will never be shaken if we are, are found in the cleft of, of that rock of Jesus but boy, do I get shaken at times. It's hard, isn't it? Because life is life. All sorts of things happen that we know about in our own lives, that we, 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 we know about in other people's lives. We watch the news. Our world gets shaken daily, whether globally or personally. But we trust. We trust in a rock that will not be shaken. And that is why we, therefore, ultimately will not be shaken because our hope is in that rock which will not be shaken. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Amen. Amen. 
Um, I believe there are still some of these available. If you would like to, um, they're one pound and they're scripturaling journals. So all of 1 Peter, 2 Peter and Jude is printed on one half of the page. And on the other half, um, there's loads of space whoop, to write notes. So um, may I encourage you, if you are a note taker, um, to grab yourself one of those. Um, I, I think there are some up at the back there. Um, yeah, just a little um, flag of that. Um, OK, thank you, James. We are ready. We're ready. OK, here we go. Living Stones, a nation of God's holy priests. Um, I hope that you're enjoying our, uh, our series at the moment as we go through 1 Peter. Um, it is a great letter uh, written by a, a great man um, to great people. Uh, the church is scattered. Um, and so far, I think... We've learnt so much um, and uh, been, been, been blessed by so much. Um, this morning we are in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to uh, 10. Let me just read them quickly. He says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So we're not going to be shaken, we're not going to be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and the stone that causes men to stumble and a rock to make them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter's opening phrase here speaks about this journey that we are on. We're all part of this journey. We call it discipleship within the church. He says here, as you can, as you can. So I just have two very quick thoughts and uh, uh, just on those um, bits there. I love it that um, that this phrase, as you come, it talks about, um, about the now. He's talking about now, as you come. He's not saying now that you have come, implying um, uh, that we've already arrived and that things have been completed, or he, neither does he say when you come, implying something that's going to happen in the future, but rather, Peter says, as you come. Peter writes, and I believe, and uh, English teachers, you can correct me here, in, because this is what Google says, uh, the perfect continuous tense. Got some, some nods, some shakes, say nothing. Um, uh, basically, it's continually happening. It's constantly happening. It's a continual present tense. Every moment of every day, as followers of Jesus, we are coming to him. We haven't yet arrived, and... Yes, ultimately, it's something that will happen in, in our future, but we're coming to him every single day. So it's a daily thing. And then secondly, he says, as you come, he doesn't put any specifications or requirements. He just says, as you come, as you are. You don't need to be anything special. You don't need to be anything unspecial. You just need to be you. As you come to him. There's no requirements or specifications that need to be met before we come to Jesus other, th other than a repentant heart and believing in him. That's the only requirement that we have because Jesus accepts you and me as you are, but he doesn't want you to stay as you are. He accepts you as you are, but he doesn't want, to st he doesn't want you to stay as you are. He wants to change you to be more like him, which is holiness. And that's exactly what Jim was talking about last week. If you missed it, go back and watch it because it was absolutely fantastic. So it's as you come. It's this action. Every single day, we're coming to Jesus. Because we can't come to Jesus passively. You can't be a spectator in the kingdom. You have to be on, 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 on this journey. 
So as you come to him, well, what is this that we are coming to? Or who is it that we are coming to? Um, Peter simply says him. Um, but him, and the ladder's there to remind us of uh, the first Sunday of the year when I brought that, that ladder in, and I said it, it's God that we're chasing after, not the things that he gives us. This is the him that we are coming to. And in the first chapter of this letter, Peter explains all about who this him is. We are coming to the one to whom we are to be obedient as his followers. That's uh, 1 verse 2. We're coming to the one we have as a living hope, a living hope due to his undeniable resurrection. That's verse 3. Him who will be revealed again. That's verse 7, 12, 13 and 20. Him who saves. Verse 9. Him who was prophesied about. Verse 10. Him who suffered and was glorified, verse 11. Him who is holy, verse 16. Him who has purchased you with his blood by his death. We've just celebrated that, verse 19. Him who was chosen before the foundation of the world, verse 20. Him through whom we believe, verse 21. Him who makes us pure as we obey, verse 22. The lifelong journey towards the goal to which we've been called heavenward is Jesus. That's who we are travelling towards. That's who we are coming to. That's the him that Peter is talking about in chapter 1. It's him that we are coming to. And, and it's as we come. It's every day. It's yesterday. It's today. It's tomorrow. It's the way back then. It's the now. And it's the one day in our future. This is the reality of our lives as followers of Jesus every day. As you come to him, every morning we get up and we put on the robe of righteousness. As you came to him yesterday, I hope that you put on that robe of righteousness. As you came to him today, or are continuing to come to him throughout today, I hope that you continue to wear that robe of righteousness. And tomorrow morning, when you put your shoes on to go off to work, don't forget, put on your robe of righteousness as well. Come to him tomorrow as well, as you come to him. And what do we do as we come? Well, chapter 1 tells us obedience. Obedience to holiness and to allow, Peter goes on to say here in, uh, uh, in chapter 2, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. He says that in verse 5 of chapter 2. To be built into the spiritual house. There's purpose for every day, isn't it? Let's go out and do some building. <laughs> Let's go and do some building. And to be a royal priesthood offering sacrifices. So, uh, holy priesthood offering sacrifices. As Jim said last week so brilliantly, holy, or to, to be holy, is to be set apart. It's to be marked out as different. I don't know about you, growing up, I felt quite different when I was in school. Um, but as Christians, we are meant to be different. We're meant to be set apart from the rest of the world to by God's help also eradicate evil things from our lives that's what it means to be holy but not not to eradicate the evil so that we're left empty but then to be filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with God's love love for God and love for people that's what Jim was talking about last week this holy priesthood priests priests were there to stand in the gap between God and humanity going to where these people are in order to witness to the good news about Jesus, to witness to the goodness of God in our lives so that they too, these other people, may recognise something different in us and ultimately that will lead to them also praising God. That's what Peter says. We're told to be a priesthood, a, a holy priesthood. We're called to a loving, sorry, we're, we're called to be loving in the broken world and called to love the people in it. And then he says, offering sacrifices. We live our lives, hopefully, as living sacrifices, willing to do what God asks us to do. I read a quote this last week that sin is when we love ourselves more than we love God. We're called to, to, to live our lives as living 
sacrifices, putting God first in all things, giving him charge of our lives, and to be active in building the house, which is basically the church. And, and Paul doesn't explicitly say it here, but he's talking about evangelism here. He's saying, go and tell people. If we love this living stone, which is Jesus, we are holy, we are filled with his love for the world and hatred for the evil in it. And then we will naturally want to show and tell of this amazing love to the world around us. So again, Peter is saying here, know who Jesus is and know who you are and now go and tell everybody. There's a great opportunity coming up for us as a church in Gowerton in a few months' time. But if you can't wait until then, we can start now. Start telling people the good news about Jesus. But notice, um, uh, 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 still in uh, verse 4, Peter swings full pendulum to the other contrast. He says, as you come to him, the the living stone, just talking about all of those amazing things that Jesus is in chapter 1, he then says these three words, which kind of come as, as a bit of a punch. He says, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by men. Peter's just built this incredible picture of of who Jesus is with such magnificent theology. And then he lands these three little words in the middle of of this sentence, which kind of judders and kind of like stops that amazing flow. He says, this living stone rejected by men. Now, Peter, arguably one of Jesus' best friends, was witness to to people's different responses to Jesus. Either people praised him or people rejected him. Peter even himself experienced both of these, right? Peter rejected Jesus those three times while Jesus was on trial. He knew what it was like to to praise Jesus and to accept Jesus, but also in moments of being shaken, which happens, he rejected Jesus in those moments, denying that he even knew him. Lord, help us to never deny you or reject you in our lives. The reference here comes from Isaiah, um, uh, where where Isaiah prophetically is speaking about uh, about our Lord. Now, for, for reasons that are beyond me, but I think this is because the Holy Spirit has revealed who Jesus is and, and in all of his majesty and, and all of his glory, but for reasons beyond me, people still choose to reject Jesus. And Isaiah got it spot on. He says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. That's probably not the line of scripture that we will use when we go and do evangelism (laughs) or when we try and share the gospel with our friends. We kind of steer clear of of that description of Jesus. But it's, it's in scripture and it is a true description of Jesus. That's how some people saw Jesus in the time of Isaiah or saw the Messiah then. It's how people saw Jesus in, the, in, in, in Jesus' earthly life, and it's how people continue to see Jesus now. They despise him. They reject him. They hide their face from him. They, they don't hold him in high esteem. Yet this is the man in, in whom we find our living hope. So clearly, Peter, in, in this passage, he's talking about two very different um, different and distinct groups of people and how they respond to Jesus. And the truth about Jesus is that you have to respond somehow. Jesus commands a response. The gospel demands a response because it's true. So we either accept it or we reject it. And Peter talks about both of those two groups in here. So first, let's have a look at who Jesus is in these verses and then we'll have a look at those two uh, responses. Got some pictures here of some cornerstones uh, and a nice pile of pebbles. Um, so um, Jesus is this cornerstone, chosen and precious to Father God. Precious to Father. And God, in his wisdom, chose to establish his son, Jesus, who, bearing in mind by some, is despised and rejected. God chose to establish Jesus as this solid base, this steady thing, this dependable thing on which God chose or chooses, continues to choose to build his church. 
God's continuing, continuing, yeah, uh, today to build his church on this cornerstone of Jesus, which is his family. And we see through the Old Testament that this was his desire. See, 1,500 years earlier, as the nation of Israel emerged out of Egypt in Exodus 19, we'll come on to that in a moment, but the, these people couldn't do it. What they were being called to do, they, they couldn't do, which is why they needed the stability and the reference point of a cornerstone that we have in Christ. They didn't know him as we do. So praise God that we live post-Jesus, because we can look back and, and see all of these things clearly, which those in the Old Testament couldn't as clearly see. See, cornerstones when building buildings, I've never built a building, but this is what I hear from builders and Google. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, cornerstones are often, or are always, the first stone to be put in place. It's that, that reference point. A, a lot of time is taken over choosing the right stone and um, uh, making that stone square and correct and putting it in the right place so that everything else can be built upon it. It's, it's the datum point. It's where they get um, the plumb line to. It, it's, everything gets built from, from that one point. And that's, uh, that's what God was doing with Jesus, our cornerstone, our being... Um, being the church, our cornerstone, the, the thing that we are built on collectively and individually is Jesus. He's our cornerstone. He's our reference point. That's why it's so important that we keep looking back to Jesus. That's why it's so important to keep coming back to Jesus. As you come to Jesus every single day, look at him. Fix your gaze on him. Fix your eyes on him. Because if he's our reference point, then why would we not want to be looking at him? He's our reference point. They were large, they were carefully shaped. They're big, important things. Uh, Peter also talks about a capstone. Now, quite a few of the commentaries that I read this week said that capstone is a bad translation of, of the word, which also means uh, cornerstone. So, um, there we go. Um, but capstones... Um, are these, these beautiful, ornate, almost like, like the crowning glory that you put on the top of y your house. Like when it's finished, you put the capstone there. So we, we could say Jesus is the beginning bit and he's the end bit and, and, and we all come in between it. We could say he's, he's that most important solid thing that we are built on, but he's also our glory. He's, he's the most beautiful thing about our lives, the thing that people's eyes should be drawn to. He's that permanent banner. So if, if Jesus is the capstone here, which had been rejected and thrown out, but it's been set up by God as the most important part of his build, which is the church. And the church today is the hope to the world on earth, empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are built on him and we are crowned with him. He's that datum point, he's that reference point. And because he's perfect, we too should be perfect. That's why Peter can say, if he is holy, you too be holy. So, what happens to these two groups of people? I think we've got another one here, here we go. Um, those who accept, or followers of Jesus, and I put here non-followers of Jesus as well on the screen there. So what happens to those who accept? Well, we are chosen. We are royal. We've been adopted into God's family. We were just saying uh, this morning, we have a cat that we adopted. Um, uh, we chose her. She didn't choose us, but, well, she doesn't have a surname, but if she did have a surname, her identity would be... <laughs> She's called Thumbelina. Um, uh, Thumbelina Owen. Yeah? That's her identity now. In, in, well, I was about to say in the same way, God's way of adopting us is far, far greater than us finding a picture of a little cat on the internet. But, but God adopts us into his family. He chooses us. And by being brought into his family, we, we are now royal because he is royal. We are royal, adopted. We are 
we are holy, we are set apart, we are made different and we're filled with the spirit and, and that love then should be flowing out of us. We are being built as the church. Verse 9, Peter says, but you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy people belonging to God. Isn't that wonderful? On those days when we feel shaken or when we are being shaken, there's a truth to hold on to. I belong to God. I belong to God. So this royal priesthood, yeah, we've been adopted. We're sons and daughters of the king of the universe. If you believe in Jesus and have made him Lord of your life and filled with his spirit, you too are royal. We're part of the royal family of the cosmos. That's an exciting thought, isn't it? That makes me feel really big. I'm part of the royal family of the cosmos. And that's always been God's desire for his people. Let me just turn up Exodus uh, chapter 19, verse uh, uh, 3 to 6. Let me just read these. So this is where um, when Moses has led God's people out of Egypt um, and uh, Moses goes up Mount uh, Sinai. He says, uh, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and, uh, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you out on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my commands, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. See, God's always wanted this nation of priests, these royal priests. He's always wanted it. These people who can show the world how good he is. That's the role of priests, to to stand between humanity and God. But, But he never got there with those people in the Old Testament, which is why he ended up just having one Um, uh, one clan, one tribe, which was the Levites. God's original plan was to have all of them as his priests, but he he had to settle for just uh, just that one family. Yet now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we are becoming this nation of priests that God has called us to. He's calling us into this nation this global nation to be able to go and tell and show of the good news of Jesus. We're now this global priesthood, a kingdom of priests sent out into the world to tell the good news of Jesus and to worship as one nation and to offer our praise. Yet we're a nation that that is completely scattered. Like the Jewish people, when they were in exile, they were still known as Jews. It, it was their identity. They were the Jewish nation, yet in various different countries. That is how we are today as, as God's people. We are um, with this nation that, that is spread all around the world. Um, the Good News Bible puts it as a chosen race, which maybe is an easier way to understand it. We're this chosen, um, uh, uh, chosen race. But the, 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 there's this oxymoron, uh, really, uh, which goes on, because we're told to be holy priests, and yet holy, as we learnt last week, well, I think as, um, uh, as we've probably learnt throughout all of our lives as followers of Jesus, holy means to be set apart, to be different, to, to be pure, which kind of puts us up on this pedestal of untouchable, like we need to be perfect, Yet we're called to be that, but we're also called to be priests. And priests go where it's mucky. Priests go to where, where the need is. So how can we be set apart and yet at the same time going to where the need is? It, it, it kind of doesn't make sense, which is why, and I do encourage you, um, uh, go back and listen again to what Jim said last week. He so brilliantly deconstructed, I think, what, what my pre- Supposition, is that the word, of, of what it means to be holy was. Jim did such a brilliant job last week 
about talking about how um, being holy is getting into the nitty gritty. And that's, that's why I think the church can be so powerful because we are holy, yet we're called to go into the, the nitty gritty, which is absolutely wonderful. We need to go into those dark, um, uh, uh, darker contexts. And I've gone right off piste. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, before, though, we get too confident and proud um, about being this holy nation, this royal priesthood, um, Peter reminds us that it's all God's doing. He goes on to say in verse, uh, verse 9, he says, um, uh, uh, you are all of uh, uh, these things so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. It was him who did it. It was that him that we were looking at earlier. He has called us out of the darkness, out of that nitty gritty into that, that wonderful light, that wonderful light where we can be pure, where we can be Holy, that is where we've been called to, by him. It, it, it's nothing of our own doing. But God has called us into that place. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people. Once you had not received mercy, <clears throat> but now you have received mercy. There was a time in our lives when we weren't a people, where we didn't have an identity. I grew up very confused as a child. All my family's Welsh. I was born in Surrey. So, I was, so my dad says I'm English by birth, but Welsh by the grace of God. <laughs> so I'm like, what? Um, but, 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 but I know that my identity is found in Jesus because it's Jesus who's called me out of darkness, out of that confusion. And boy, is that world confusing out there. We get so many messages. We're just bombarded constantly with what we should be, what we shouldn't be, what we should look like, what we should drive, the jobs that we should have. Yet our identity is found in Jesus. He has called us out of that confusion into clarity. Once we were not a people, but now we were a people. Once we had not received mercy, we were dead in our sins, but now we have received mercy. We've been made alive in Christ. We've been made alive in Christ. And we are built on that rock that cannot be shaken. So therefore, nothing can separate us now from his great love. I've seen the time, so I shall try and be quick. Um, what then for those who choose to reject Jesus? Well, what we read in scripture, it, it doesn't bode well. It says they stumble and they fall because the truth that they've rejected, the truth that Jesus is God and has power to save, but people have have continually rejected Jesus. The Romans did it. The Jewish, uh, the Jewish leaders did it. Many people then did it. Many people today still reject Jesus. But Jesus triumphed. Jesus triumphed and, and therefore demonstrated that he was telling the truth and that he, he does indeed hold all authority. And that he, he was able to lay down his life and pick it up again. And he has this authority to judge. So you either love him or you'll come to loathe him as you stumble and fall. Peter talks about this here. But the offer for those to receive this mercy, the offer for people to be called from that darkness into his wonderful light, the offer for people to, to go from being not a people to a people to be a people is there. The offer is there. So come. Don't, don't miss out on that offer. I don't know where each person here is at. Like, like many people go to church for years and years and years, yet still haven't actually met Jesus. So if you're in that place this morning, if you don't yet know Jesus, don't miss up on the opportunity. Why not, why not come to know him today? Kev said, we have good news and it's for everybody. And that good news it, 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 is, is that God who knows you, God who loves you, wants to call you from, from this confusion, from, from this darkness, into the, this clarity and into this wonderful light of who he is. He wants to call us from building our lives on jelly to building our lives on solid rock. That's the difference, isn't it? God wants to, to, um, God wants to call us into his family, 
It's the best place to be, guys. If you are a follower of Jesus this morning, this is our identity. We're chosen, we're royal, we're a priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're called from that darkness into wonderful light and we've received mercy. And as we go to Jesus, we are being used to build the church, stone by stone, stone by stone. We're all stones. We're all rocks being built into this perfect church. And yet it's our responsibility, as I said earlier, to go and get other rocks because the church hasn't been finished yet. We know that because Jesus hasn't come back yet. So there are still people who Jesus wants in his building, who, who he wants in his church, in his family. See, Jesus is that support that it all starts from and that, and, and that it starts with. He, ups, he upholds us all. He upholds us all. And he brings us into his family to build the family. And it just keeps on growing and growing and growing. So what is the hope? Where's this good news? Well, uh, other than what we read about ourselves being built into this holy nation, it seems a bit hopeless for those who haven't yet um, uh, 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 been built in. But, but this is the, um, the, uh, the exciting truth, is that it's as we are being built, we are a witness to those around us. And, and as we are being filled by the, the Holy Spirit and just living as Christians, people, hopefully, this is what the Bible says, will, will see our praise of God, will, will see our witness. They will look at our lives and they will want to come and join us. They want to come and join in. That's the good news. We call it evangelism. And often we go out and, and, and try and like chat to people and often people go, no, thank you. Um, but if people observe the difference in our lives, I think that's the challenge really of, of this passage is... is are we living our lives so differently, so counterculturally, that people see something different about us and choose to also uh, come and follow Jesus? I'm going to close just with this here. It's our, it's our responsibility to build the church and to show Jesus to the world. Peter seems to be uh, reminding us as we go through his letter, know who you are, know who Jesus is, and go and tell people, go and tell people, and live your lives in such a way that people will want to come and join in as well. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we are a chosen people. Thank you that you have chosen us to be in your family. Thank you that because of that we are royal. Thank you that you've called us to be this, this holy nation of, of priests, holy because of what you have done for us and are continuing to do in us. And, and this global nation, this, this global family, Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done in our lives up until this point. Help us, Lord, to come to you every day, to be filled with your spirit so that we can go out and share the good news of Jesus, but also, Lord, to be filled with your spirit so that those who we do life with might see something different about us and inquire so that they too, Lord, may be saved from, from that darkness and come into your wonderful like, Lord, thank you for showing me your mercy. Thank you for showing each one of us your mercy. We pray, Lord, for those who we know and who we love who haven't yet received your mercy. And we pray, Lord, that through our witness or through the witness of other people, you would break into their lives like you did into ours, Lord. Amen.
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest prayer, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ in 
Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy in the world. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory. spoken Lord we we believe that they are true and we pray that as we go through our week Lord that you would just keep on reminding us of them Lord that it's not by us it's not by our doing but it's through you that's in us Lord Lord would you just um just bless us this week Lord, I pray that you would just be with us um that we would be able to shine your light through our workplace through our homes through our schools wherever we are situated Lord I pray that you would just enable us to do that in Jesus name we pray amen <laughs>